was just wondering uh, if you could tell us a little bit about how you started working in costume design and how it led to you working for Charles Sellier and Sun Classics. I had recently got divorced from a crazy man and moved back to Logan, Utah, for where my brother lived. And was thinking of going back to college. I was 22, I think. And then um, my brother said, oh, I'm working in the film business now. And I was like, what? And uh, Chuck Sellier was recruiting people to be in his company that he was starting. And he was looking for like 20 to 30 year olds. So we didn't have to pay very much. <laughs> and he, so he had the, the main people that knew what they were doing sort of, and then the rest of us. And his company was in Park City. And um, I guess my brother had already made a movie with him. So I was like, I don't know what this is, but this is what I'm gonna do. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. And so uh, they all left for Page, Arizona to do Greatest Heroes of the Bible miniseries, <laughs> which I know you've seen, it's gorgeous. It's a cavalcade of stars, which was amazing. Oh my God, I don't even know how they got them to come to the desert to uh, do that. An aging shepherd risks his life to make a stand against a cruel and selfish pharaoh. The story of a people's oppression and of the man chosen by God to freedom. A story of conflict which unleashes God's awesome justice upon the land of Egypt and of a man's fate matched against the forces of pharaoh in the story of Moses. Starring Julie Adams as the queen, Robert Alda as the vizier, Lloyd Buckner as Imhotep, Joseph Campanella as the pharaoh, Anne Francis as Zipporah, Frank Gorshin as Okra, and John Marley as Moses. I, I went there and my brother got a job as a local for me. And the, his old girlfriend that was down there working on it, she said I could stay in her room. So I went down there and stayed with her and I told them I could sew. So they put me in the into making costumes where they quickly found out that I was a bit of an imposter <laughs> in sewing. <laughs> so they got me into making helmets and crafty stuff. And the designer really didn't like the customers on the set who were all quickly becoming my best friends. <laughs> she, was, she was older and the costume designer. And so she tried to turn me into a double agent by sending me to the set. And then I was supposed to report back what they were doing because they weren't putting the costumes on properly. They were Hebrews and they had got the Navajo nation out there to be the Hebrews. Really? Um, oh, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> it was really wild. And they would put these ketons on, which are like long t-shirts. And she made them out of polyester. I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying. And then <laughs> she would like to have archers and different categories for their armor, but they all look the same. So I immediately decided I was staying out there on the set. And so were you always crafty? Did you always like to sew and stuff? Is that how you kind of fell into like that? Taught myself to sew in high school. And I had to take home mech because that's what girls did then. And then they taught us how to make an apron. So I kind of, I've always been crafty and artsy. I can make stuff. I always say I'm a movie sewer. Like, I can quickly make something fit you, but you wouldn't want to wear it for very long. Like <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the next time you went out for dinner or something. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so it's okay because I was quick and I, and also I loved clothes. I had a thing in high school where I was never going to wear the same outfit twice. And we didn't have any money. So I had to thrift shop and wait for sales. And, and I just really liked it. So you didn't go to any big like fashion school or anything. You just learned kind of on the job and self-taught and had good mentors. Yeah. 
And I remember in high school, and I was in the hippie era, so I would make like big feather earrings and stuff like that. And I was going to a Mormon high school in Utah, which, yeah. So I had a typing teacher <laughs> and she made us go out on an interview to see if we could get the job. And apparently I came back and they had commented on my clothing. And she said to me, you will never get a job dressing like you do. She was laughing now. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> she made a whole career out of it. She didn't know what the hell she was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know what to do with me. Anyway, so that's how I got in. And then they got picked up for a second season. I don't know how. And we saw I was in Lake Powell for a year and it was really fun. It seemed like you were with Celier for a little while. You did quite a few productions with him. Yeah, so. so after that got canceled, we all came back to Perk City. And then we did... Just, we made these really bad films, pretty much. And, <laughs> and we were all like 20s, early 30s. So you know how that goes. And it was just really wild. And the beginning of how Park City got big. And... So I married the construction guy and we had a baby. We moved to Idaho. We were like, we can't have a baby and be in the film business. So we're just going to get back to our hippie ways. We didn't have phones or anything, but somehow I called my mom or something. And she said, you know, these people from Sun Classic Pictures are trying to find you guys. And they really want you to come to Vegas and work on a show. And so we said we'll go we'll go into town and we'll think about it and we'll have dinner and it took us like two minutes to get packed up and leave <laughs> we were we were there in vegas in no time sun classic seems like it was a great place to make your bones i guess this vegas thing was with pia Sedora and her husband owned the casino and he she wanted to be a movie person so he hired all the sun classic people then we went back to sun classics and made in Search of Historical Jesus, which we all call Hysterical Jesus, because it was so bad. But he would get these really good people. I can't remember who Jesus was, but he was this great actor. And, um, yeah, he'd get tons of great people. Uh, I can't think off the top of my head right now either, but I remember Robert Culp played some, a part in one of those uh, greatest heroes of the Bible. Uh, God, you had... Um, I, don't remember I can't either. think right now, but there was a lot of them. There was a lot there of them. Were. I was impressed by the cast list too. Yeah, yeah. And they're fun. Much. Like you watch them now and um, they were kind of like uh, the Game of Thrones for the 70s. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> they didn't have like those kinds of shows at the time, you know? A man of peace is forced to take up arms in order to carry out God's justice. A man betrayed by his own brother in a ruthless, bloody quest for power. The story of a people divided by its leaders. And of one man's battle to reunite them. A man of wisdom and courage. Named Solomon. Starring John Carradine as David. Kevin Dobson as Joab. Tom Halleck as Solomon. Stephen Keats as Benaiah. Carol Lawrence as Bathsheba, and John Saxon as Adonijah. They built all these elaborate sets and everybody was, you know, recruited to be an extra at some point and I remember doing a scene where I got shot with an arrow and that's cool. my back you know <laughs> I mean, like, oh, that's cool. it was it was crazy and um I got a letter from the government saying that um they had to give me more money because I wasn't even making minimum wage so wow. they had to um because I was a, a local and then I started getting like hundred dollars i don't know this and i was so happy <laughs> i was so happy yeah. and chuck salier would rent us boats and stuff on the weekends and he'd give us clothes and sunglasses you know it was like a, it was a great thing and then eventually i i moved up to canon <laughs> canon films 
the home of high powered, high voltage motion picture entertainment. With the screen's biggest spectacles, brightest stars, and boldest lineup of explosive entertainment. We're taking motion picture excitement over the edge and your box office over the top. We're Canon Films, and we're Dynamite. How did you end up working for Canon? I guess would be just sort of a simple question. Um, Utah is a right to work state. If you were good or even kind of good at your job, you would have to basically get every film that came to town. Canon came to town with that ninja movie and I was right there when I got on it and uh, they liked me. And then I did another one where they let me design but as a supervisor, of course. That was fun. And then I got onto the uh, Chuck Norris groove. I assisted on one in um, St. Kitts. And then my husband was working on it. Then he went home with our son and I stayed. And then they liked me. And so they took me to the Philippines to do Missing in Action 1. Was your husband building the sets or like you said he was in construction? I, so was I he think doing at that time he was, he went from sets to special effects and he, did a lot of, you know, Vietnam stuff. He was it. he had been a Green Beret in Vietnam. Vietnam, 1984. Chuck Norris is James Brad. Decorated war hero. Ex-prisoner of war. An American on a mission. One man who couldn't forget the Americans that were left behind. We categorically deny that there are any living MIA in Vietnam. Wrong answer. James Braddock has returned. <laughs> to uncover the truth and free the soldiers. We're going home? Missing in action. Damn right. James Braddock yeah! declares war. The war isn't over until the last man comes home. America had no more heroes. Until now, Chuck Norris, missing in action. Uh, the second one was supposed to be the first one, but the <laughs> the first one, <laughs> <yeah>, whatever. <laughs> but yeah. I was just um, wondering, uh, yesterday uh, when we chatted, you alluded that you had some funny stories about Chuck Norris. And I also love Joseph Zito, uh, who directed uh, the first movie, which was really the second movie. <laughs> so I was wondering, <laughs> um, uh, do you have any fun stories or um, any, you know, just any experiences that you remember from working on those films, working with uh, Joseph Zito uh, or um, or Chuck Norris? The one I did in the in um, the Virgin or the uh, the island one. That was the first British movie. Islands. When yeah. I, uh, yeah, that that was. I just came for like two weeks as a hired hand, you know, to clean or dirty up soldiers and stuff. So I didn't really get to, I didn't really know, I don't even know if I was on the set very much. I was just, you know, new blood because everybody was passing out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So <laughs> when I went to the second one, that's when I really got, really met Joe and um, Chuck and, yeah. and there was like, 10 of us like that guess that went to the philippines the main people i was the only woman um later they a script supervisor came and it was very um shall we say me too time yeah get imagine. you know yeah i can imagine Ugh. and so that was going on and i was kind of trying to 
not have it go on. And uh, Joe Zito was the first, and he. And what happens is, if you don't play the game, they just treat you badly. That's, yeah. you know, so yeah. Zito kind of was treating me badly. Oh, that sucks. Really. That's and total. then Chuck made his move. <laughs> Many wow. times in the trailer. Oh my god! <laughs> then, I can't believe I'm kidding. I'm gonna tell you this. I don't know where I'm going. Don't kill me. <laughs> well, remember, whatever I cut together, I'm gonna show to show it to you first. So, so yeah. So um. he calls me, and um, one night, kind of late. I can't remember if I had dinner with him and some other people or what. We got some drinks. And he calls me up in my room and he goes, "So, are you ever gonna fuck me or what?" Oof. Oh, my God. <laughs> Holy shit. Talk about man. direct. Talk about Jeez. direct. Jeez. Yeah. I was like, oh, my God, you're so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's and a great like, response. Uh, <laughs> and I said, no, I'm he's, not. He so stole my heart. Yeah. <laughs> so then he got really mean, and I had a whole show to do with him. And I just thought that was so wrong. He was married. Totally, wife was yeah. coming. Joe Zito's wife was coming, you know. Wow. And yeah. I just was like, so this one night, we were shooting and a whorehouse was the scene. Mm -hmm. I don't remember why Chuck was at the whorehouse. He was at the whorehouse. I don't so remember was... either. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they probably just put it in so they could do it. <laughs> the scene in the whorehouse, man. Yeah. So, there was this little house that was really sad in there, and um, it was pouring, pouring, pouring rain. And they parked my truck really far away, of course, because they're fucking with me now. And um, everybody just third world countries shitting and pooping in the streets and whatever, you know, and the, the, the water's this deep, and I'm sloshing back to my trailer. Oh. <laughs> you know, get some stuff, I come back, then they want me to change these other prostitutes I'm slashing back and I'm getting some clothes and I'm changing and finally I'm like and the cameraman was my butt so I went over and I go can I look through your lens he was like yes you can and I looked and those prostitutes weren't even in the frame oh. they were just making me oh, do that. Oh. what a waste of time what assholes yeah, yeah so I being me Sloshed back into my trailer, grabbed my stuff, hailed a cab, and went to the hotel. Wow, what a couple of assholes! I, I I hate saying that I like Joseph Zito and or, and uh, Chuck Norris now. I was just saying, oh yeah, I love them. Can you tell us about a story? Yeah. Oh, now I'm like, now I'm like, fuck those guys. Like, yeah. yeah, they and, and I up. took I just took all my clothes off, and I had to throw them all away. I had to throw all my shit away because it was just. Wow, man, gross. Can't do it. And you know, I had to get new shoes. And I just wow. got in bed and I just, I just didn't go back to work for a couple of days. Oh, boy. Like, yeah. Surprised you went yeah. back at all. Yeah. I, I wanted this job. I was like, it was like one of my, a big costume design job for me. Sure. I wanted the job. And I really, it was, it was, it was rough. And then Aaron, his, Step coordinator brother or cousin or oh yeah Aaron right. Norris yeah mm -hmm. he was really on me too and I had this black sweater and of course it's so humid and it's on Chuck and it was really cool like really cool sweater but not so cool if it's uh, humid and, <laughs> and, and the sleeves it just starts growing you know like your clothes do <laughs> yeah. I remember Chuck going my sleeves are growing <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And then Aaron took me aside and, and gave me hell for saying, why are you trying to make Chuck look bad? What's the matter with you? Why aren't you? And I was just like, wow. really? Chill out, guys. Like, just... Yeah. And I'm in the middle of nowhere and I can't get anything. You know, I can only get what I can get and get stuff shipped to me. And then I was going somewhere. I got kidnapped. That you was got, fun. You got kidnapped out there? Like for real kidnapped? Oh my yeah. God. What? I was going to get some, I was trying to find some US Army stuff, you know, and, and there was supposedly this surplus place. 
and they, they told me about so I got in a cab and I told the guy you know I, I need to go out there and try to find some U.S. stuff and he's like oh okay I know where that is and we just started driving and I'm just you know working on my stuff in the car in the back seat and everything <laughs> so we're driving and driving, driving and finally like um I, I think he spoke to Gollum so I don't know but I was like I don't think we're going anywhere and it got, got more jungly and jungly and oh jungly and then I, I just figured out I'm like I think this guy's kidnapping me and he and he wouldn't stop and he just kept going and going and then finally he kind of slowed down and I just did an old tuck and roll out the door oh my oh. god and started running wow. and running into the jungle and it it, it was so beyond my imagination you right. know and I couldn't there's no fault you don't have phones you don't it so finally terrified. I terrified I was terrified wow and I was happy because I got away I, I figured yeah because that could have been really bad in yeah. traffic or something you know so I found that finally found a, a place with a phone booth and I got somebody that could speak English and I said I, I need to call the Manila hotel and so they got me through and then somebody came out and got me oh my Oof. gosh that's terrifying that is thank terrifying god. thank god you survived that whatever was waiting for you in the jungle I, was not good i'm sure i have a lot of ptsd in my life and that's my what atlanta wow. I mean, yeah, I'm my sorry god yeah i'm sorry to hear that i'm sorry to hear yeah. the missing in an action like production was so you shitty. know what though after that it kind of settled down a little bit because their wives came and there was a lot less. Meh. You should have pulled him aside and said, hey. Uh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk to you about your husband. Hey, guess what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Has your husband ever said, are you going to fuck me or what? <laughs> you should have like, answered, you should have answered the question uh, in front of his wife. Like, oh, Chuck, by the way, uh, the I'm not answer your fuck question, you, I, the answer is no. Honestly, I just knew I was in a very male dominated career and I had to put up with shit and I'm pretty tough and I was like you are not taking away my chance to become a costume designer which is what I'm working at wow well, I mean I now I don't know I don't know should I have done that I was 24 25 well I mean... yes I mean should I have just gone home I don't think I ever told my husband. I mean, if he sees this. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think you, this on there. Well, you did. What it's you, really shitty. You did what you had to do to survive and make it in your industry and your career. I mean, unfortunately, and there's hundreds, maybe thousands of women that had to do the same thing, right? I mean, that's what yeah. led to the Me Too movement. So, I mean. Yep. And it's everything um, they say. It's ev it's every bit true, because I, people get like full of themselves like Chuck can just take it for granted. He got divorced shortly after that. Two warriors. One in the service of evil. One bound by honor and vengeance must fight to the death because only a ninja can kill a ninja revenge of the ninja the great martial arts explosion of the 80s comes to america with full force Can you describe your approach to costume supervising or design for Revenge of the Ninja? Like, what were some of the key influences or inspirations behind uh, the costume choices? Well, the first person was Nomi Golan, supervisor. As <laughs> I told Christian that we were only allowed to be called costume supervisor, so he didn't have to pay us costume designer fee money. Yeah, even though it was his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'm surprised he even that. paid her at all. Right. <laughs> he Maybe he didn't, actually. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he just said, oh, you can do that job. I'm taking you. Um, so then she left the film, and I became the supervisor. 
So honestly, I don't really know how much she did before I started. It seemed like most people just showed up in their clothes. Um, really? And then Ninja is, you know, a ninja and the Japanese women came in all their gear. And um, I do remember putting that outfit on, on Steve. That the the gay plan boy? Ca- that one. The cowboy. Yeah, but how did that happen? How- all of their costumes, all of the villains, the village people costumes, like how did that come about? And how did Steve wind up in that gay flamboyant ca- cowboy outfit? <laughs> Honestly, I don't remember. I think I was supposed to do different characters. Mm-hmm. And I we were gonna make Steve a cowboy, I think. I think this is how it happened. And then I just kept piling stuff on him big feather <laughs> like just big there. feather and a, and a thing and then he, I, I noticed in the in the when i was watching it again he had my belt buckle that was a beaded rose and, <laughs> oh that was and your belt buckle thing, <laughs> yeah and then, and then the next thing i know he had a mustache and it was just over he was so into it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah he was he, way he into is, it yeah um, he was really into it and then the guy the the biker, I'm sure I was doing a biker and then the guy with the Japanese flag. I just, you know, we didn't have much money. Um, we just. Just playing with what you had. Yeah. 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 Makes yeah. Sense. And a lot of things I had to get doubles on. So it was like trying to get doubles, but not spend a lot of money and all that kind of thing. So on Revenge of the Ninja, because Nomi Golan left the production, you kind of had to kind of step up, I guess, a little bit. Which was a good opportunity for you, right? So you kind of stepped oh, yeah, up and had great. to, yeah. But I'm sure that led to you being the costume designer on Ninja Three, right? You did such a good job. Oh, yes, they were definitely like carried on to that. Definitely. And it goes back to that thing when once you're you're liked, you know, and the crew likes you, or you Sam liked, you know, then you're they're like, okay, you can why don't you just do the next one? And I don't think anybody was at that point interested in costumes as much as they were martial arts. <laughs> Where Revenge of the Ninja left off, Ninja 3 begins. An epic struggle of superhuman strength and supernatural forces. Ninja 3, The Domination. Nancy, had you ever even heard of a ninja before you started on this production? <laughs> you just like, what the hell is that? <laughs> okay, that's no. what. I what? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I figured. No, show oh. taught me all I know about ninjas. <laughs> okay, he taught us all we know about ninjas too. <laughs> How was it working with Sam Furstenberg for uh, the first time on uh, on Revenge of the Ninja? I mean, everyone else just loves him. He's such a great guy. He is patient and funny and knowledgeable and i i don't know how you don't like him right, yeah, <laughs> right. you know and he's so enthusiastic he brings the enthusiasm of he 10 really people does. so then you're like all enthusiastic too and you know he knows how to keep the enthusiasm going so they keep going because films can stop on a dime and then that's really costly and so he was, he was great. He was really great. I still, he still is great. Yeah. Has he ever had an enemy? I mean, everyone I've talked to says they lost <laughs> him. I mean, every single person. I mean, in his book, uh, Marco Seidelman's book about him, his wife even says she's never heard him raise his voice or get mad or like in anger. And it's like, he makes these super violent movies. I mean, there's got to be some sort of psychological thing going on there. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but but yeah, he's so great. Yeah, and I was telling you about like going into the production office where every all the Israeli crew that were running the show were like crazy, screaming and yelling and swearing and and half of it I couldn't understand what they were saying and it was scary in there, you know. And then you went out. <laughs> <laughs> and just like wanted to ask a question or get some petty cash or and they were just there just yeah well, like petty cash forget about it <laughs> yeah. be right in your face <laughs> look at again in your trailer i'm sure you can find something that you can make into whatever you need <laughs> <laughs> that's so great <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, uh, so true. So true. And then you'd go out and Sam would be, hi. Are the ninjas ready? <laughs> Let's do this. You know, and I'd be like, well, what is up with those? But, I, but the more I worked with them, they just said, this is just how we work. Mm-hmm. We, we yell at each other and scream and that's how we work. And I was like, it was just their style and culture kind of yeah thing, that's their style know? yeah and that's what makes sam so different you know Sh- shmuel looks so like gentle and kind and soft-spoken i think in that crew especially he kind of stood out i think probably yeah and he can get you to do stuff you know like that you might not want to do because he's just like oh come on can do it. <laughs> that's his tactic that's his yeah. <laughs> it's a good tactic and then you're like okay i can yeah. do that I, I was wondering i mean this kind of plays into that you know um golden globus were so notoriously cheap um often fighting with their department heads over budgets and money revenge of the ninja is really a great example of accomplishing a lot with very little and um I was wondering, you know, I know this is kind of a, a broad question, but could you tell us a little bit about, you know, designing under such budgetary constraints and how the Canon film sort of differed compared to many of your later big budget Hollywood productions? You know, I mean, you went from working in like this little tiny fishbowl to going into like the ocean, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah. I was just kind of curious. I know it's kind of a broad question, but. You know, we we just had to make everything up everyone was making everything up and like i think i told you i i had all this these policemen and i couldn't afford police uniforms so i went to the you know ace hardware somewhere and got a bunch of blue dickies and got somebody to make some patches and then sewed them all (laughs) you know got some ties and or whatever they were and just Okay, that, that's good. That looks like a cop, you know, <laughs> work and bring your own black shoes and bring your own. There was a lot of that. And bring your own white T-shirts, and, you know. And then, like I said, later, I realized that they had places that you walked in and they had in Hollywood where they just had every uniform that was ever made for anybody, every patch, everything. And I was just, I don't know. I did a lot of stuff like, Dying, over dying things that I already had. And, you know, it, there wasn't, I wouldn't exactly call it a costume design show. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay. okay. And how long? Was, I, you know. I forgot to ask too with uh, Nomi Golan. Um, before she left the production, like how long were you working on it with like her? Were you guys working together for a few weeks and then she was gone and then. You were on it for another few weeks by yourself. I mean, like, like I think she was only there for about a, a week, maybe two. Okay, so you were really thrown into the fire. They're just like, hey, you know, figure it out. Even even when she was there, she wasn't there. She gotcha. was just always wild and angry and and. I don't know. They'd have a name for it today, but I don't know what you would call it. And I think it was, it's probably manic, I think. Ma- oh, very manic, very yeah. manic. And she liked, we got along, but it was like, first I had to deal with her before I could start dressing people because she wasn't doing her job. And then, I don't know. I just was seat of my pants for probably <laughs> 10 years of my career. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, I feel the same way in my career. <laughs> yeah, don't we all? And then when I finally made it to Hollywood, I was like, oh, I just learned how to not do everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I learned how to do everything wrong. And now I have to figure and out how to do it right. Everything I learned, I'll just go against it and I'll be really good. <laughs> hey, and it worked. I mean, man, you went yeah, on to some worked. huge iconic movies. I mean, yeah, that's awesome. Oh. And also the thing I really liked, liked about my job was I like characters. I like making characters and helping the actor become who he thinks the character is by his clothing and working with them and that sort of thing rather than fashion or 
you know, we're going to go out and spend $700 to make you look like a, you live in an apartment. <laughs> you know, that, that there's a lot of designers, big designers that just want to get all the expensive stuff and do all that. I just came. I loved finding things old and aged and, and, the, and the actors love that. They love it. So character acting was kind of my thing. Yeah, it's funny because like Chris and I will talk to Sam and stuff and, and Steve and these guys and who are involved in these movies. And they're always so amazed at the, these low budget canon films, some of them that they worked on, especially the ones Sam did, have such a cult following now or such a, um, you know, a, a just overall reception amongst, you know, film fanatics. I mean, do, do you ever look back at the, the canon stuff and just think like, Oh, you know, I'm really proud of, you know, these, these specific characters or specific costumes or the overall look or 80s aesthetics of a lot of his films and go, oh, that's a lot. You know, that was a lot of fun. Or do you just kind of be like, man, that was insane times. I'm much more proud of my, you know, well, bigger projects. Yeah. Right. No, Revenge w was just a huge learning experience fast and a lot of that I didn't do. I don't know if know me. I don't know if like I can't think of the actor's name that only wears the top part of her gi. <laughs> oh, I know. I know uh, you're talking. About. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> that saves money right there. <laughs> yeah, that's they have that's 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 budget on her. Yeah. Pantyhose on as they right. would, as you would. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Yeah. 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 I didn't do that, but <laughs> she might have just said, that's what I'm going to do. Right. Like, okay, you go, girl. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of it was sort of uh, focused on what Shell wanted or what Sam wanted. or And, and then when it just came to the street people, it was... <laughs> It, I just watched it again and I laughed pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, it wasn't what I was looking for in my career, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's sure. amazing, though. Sure. It's so good. Yeah, uh, and so, and but like, again, you learn so much. And there's, you know, those kind of films, you just have to have, you have to have five of everything or six. So it's not like you just pick something out, a one-of-a-kind thing. You have to be able to make five more of them and different sizes and put them on different people and they, you know. So by the time I got to the second one, I, I was a lot more experienced with, you know, making things and night with my sewing machine or trying to make them more interesting, let's say, instead of just a black ninja or something. Well, that, that, so, that costume in this, uh, in Ninja 3 is so much more elaborate than, than yeah. the revenge ones. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that maybe just a little bit, because it's, first of all, it's very iconic. Um, and the fans seem to love that costume more than any other costume. They make action figures out of it. They try to, you know, I've seen artists draw that costume. Yeah, I, I wanted to do something. I was so tired of black ninjas, <laughs> sure. you know, and I, I think everybody was happy to, have something else more interesting or whatever and it was a woman like more street like kind of a camouflage because the ninjas wouldn't always just be black you know and i wanted to make it more just more interesting and so i worked on that quite a bit and and i i like the way it came out and then years later i looked at some stuff online and there were other people in it Chuck Norris was in it, and somebody else was in it too, another guy. <laughs> Ninja 3 in general, you know, is like sort of a time capsule for, you know, the 80s aesthetic. You know, it's 1984. Yes. The costumes are, like we already said, a little bigger, more elaborate than uh, Revenge of the Ninja. Um, you know, you have uh, the more elaborate ninja outfit, but you also have, you know, all those aerobics outfits that are, you know, uh, like yeah, you know, pastel well, colors and stuff. And then you have what? The leggings. Two, all the police <laughs> outfits, because the villains are all cops. You know, it must have just been such a huge task. Um, I mean, you already kind of got your train wheels on the first movie, but uh, I just thought it was so much bigger when it comes to costume design. It looked like it was just so much and, bigger. And I think I only had one assistant. And she had never done costuming either before. I mean, at least I had done quite a few things, but she was doing something else. And then I, we may have had a local, but 
we we dyed everything ourselves. We bought the fabrics. We had them sewn. We were sewing everything. And one night, I remember that she, we were going to make some gray ninjas for something. I don't. I'll have to watch that movie again. Um, and she came with her head down in the morning, and I said, "What happened?" And she goes, "They're all purple." <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Well. It's like. You know, Sam's in my sky, but I don't know if he's going to go for purple ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> he might. <laughs> you never know. He probably would have said, oh, Nancy, just bring him out. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, make yeah. It work. well, they'll go really fast. They won't know. Uh, so I, I can't remember what we did. We kept dying them and dying them until they weren't purple anymore. Well, an American know. ninja, he has yellow ninjas, red ninjas, green ninjas, blue ninjas. <laughs> so I mean, he goes crazy in <laughs> American ninja. So a purple I one would have been. That. <laughs> I could have watched that. Purple would have been. Yeah, purple purple would have been better than yellow. How do you hide when you're in a yellow and ninja outfit? <laughs> but it's gotta you know, be a certain atmosphere. Like I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yellow Daisy leaves. Field, uh, I don't a know. Yellow field of flowers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Daisies. I guess. Dandelions. Um, yeah. Right. Exactly. Mm. Uh, was was it flowers. um was it like a conscious decision as you're rolling along to make it like as contemporary at the time as the 80s like or were you like i want to make this as loud as 80s as possible combining it with ninja elements or was it just we need to work with what we have and see what we can do just because it, she was an aerobics teacher so there was all that fun stuff to do but you know she she had some costumes like that I didn't ever have to do. There was never a woman at before that. So it was just, you know, and there's only so many places you can shop in Phoenix, Arizona in the 1980s. So you gotta, you know, you gotta yeah. Kinda, yeah, you gotta go 1980s. Pretty mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And you have to ask people like extras and stuff to come to rest. And, you know, there's that thing going on too. And But it was fun. I, I enjoyed doing that film. It was hard. It was very hard. He is the most feared and powerful warrior. A ninja who breaks from ancient tradition and explodes onto America. His soul possesses the body of an innocent woman and transforms her into a lethal assassin. Who are you? I want you to help her. Only a ninja can destroy a ninja. Her only hope is your mother. The Master Ninja, who has been sent to destroy him. How was it working with uh, Lucinda? She was great. Uh, although... <laughs> well, come on, we, get, us, we yeah. want the dirt. Give us the uh, dirt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I remember it was Halloween, and I'm, as you can tell, I'm very sarcastic and very off the wall and um so we had a, a party and i went as a overweight aerobic teacher in one of her outfits <laughs> 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 so I, I took one of them and just patted myself all up and everything and, and I, don't, I don't i don't think she thought it was funny <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome oh that's so great i uh... just remember her go, like <laughs> 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 Oh, that's so Why funny. Are you doing that? Mm. So, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I didn't get fired or anything, so that was good. The, um, Liz Sinodecki, I mean, I was 10 years old when I saw that. Um, she was one of my first, like, screen crushes that I can remember. I, I, I loved her in that and the break-in movies because I saw those around the same time. But uh, it's common knowledge that Shokasugi was not happy playing co-star to Liz Sinodecki in the third movie. And I was just kind of curious, because I've often wondered, you know, she doesn't have a very big filmography. You know, that was her first movie. Um, she also had problems with her co-star in the break-in movies. You know, I've also often wondered, like, 
what it was like working with such you know hostility towards her on her first movie on set and like did you feel any of that tension between her and show on your day-to-day -day production or did you was show any different towards you on this production compared to the first production because i know he was with certain people like like Stephen lambert on ninja 3 they were not really talking a lot and like there was a lot of weird tension going on yeah i think you're right i think with lucinda too it was it was she didn't seem like she was enjoying it as much as she should or could and i think that was from show and she had a lot of good scenes and a lot of you know and i yeah, it had a it. That's why I shouldn't have put me a aerobic outfit on. <laughs> <laughs> you just tiled on. I just tiled on. You're just to making a joke, though. I, I, I knew it was good. I could have went to the show. I mean, no, no, I it's Halloween. Fun. You're just having fun. I mean, you know. I was trying to have some fun. And sure. It, it, she kind of. She struggled. Do you know a lot of times actresses are really really nice and they just are like whatever. Who needs whatever do it? And she just she felt to me like I, she was doing a really good job, but that she wasn't maybe getting enough accolades for that for show. That's all I remember. I just I was pretty busy. <laughs> but yeah, show is very, you know, he wants his he's an amazing perk man and um to have a woman he probably wouldn't have been his first choice <laughs> yeah well he went from the co-star in enter the ninja he was a co-star to franco nero and then he went to being the lead and yeah. revenge of the ninja and then he went back to the co-star so i could see how he'd be a little slighted like like what's going on here you know that reminds me too because i wanted to ask you uh, going back to revenge of the ninja what was it like just in general working with Sho? And what was it like working with Ken Kasugi? Because uh, he was so young. He was great. They were great. Sho was, Sho was lovely. And he always made time to talk to me. And he had that assistant that made all the props that was working with him, was, who was also a really good guy. And, and then the kid came. The kid was fun and lively. And I, re I just remember to be a really good experience with both of them. You know, Show did his own thing. He was a, a actor dream for me. <laughs> I didn't have time to get it, you know. He's, and he helped me, like, do everything properly and, you know, nice. make sure everything's good. And, and uh, he was busy. I just watched him again on that thing. Oh boy, those fight scenes. Yeah. He's busy and he's playing other parts in the movie too. <laughs> you know, like you don't even know it's him, but he's playing other parts. Um, but yeah. was he the uh, was he the same way on the third movie? I mean, I know that he was angry with Makaim and angry with some other people because of being the co-star on the third movie. But did you have the same working relationship with him on the third movie? I mean, I'm not trying to like badmouth him or anything. I didn't notice, but maybe because he wasn't around as much. Yeah. I mean, you're not yeah, focused I, on that stuff. I was just wondering, you know. Uh, yeah, no, and I hadn't really thought of it like that. But yeah, I, I imagine he's he was, not his feelings were hurt, but his ego somehow. Yeah. I mean, he's I, an amazing man, and I, it happens all the time in the film industry. No one really knows what happened. Sam Sam says he, he doesn't know why uh, Makaim wanted a female all of a sudden. He didn't know if it was just an idea that Makaim had or if him and show had a falling out because he had a, th a three picture deal. So like Sam said, he's not really sure why he became the co-star, but that's the way Makaim wanted it on the third movie. And he was upset because they dubbed his voice on Revenge. And he didn't know that until he went to see the movie and that really upset him too. Oh, I could see why. Yeah, really, that's not right. And maybe they just wanted to get a woman in there you know, to get a, another audience or put a spin on it. Or for me, how many ninja movies can you do? It, well, yeah, I mean, it did right. put a different spin on it. I mean, Flashdance meets Poltergeist meets ninjas. I mean, it's pretty, yeah, exactly. pretty wild, pretty wild idea. Uh, that's, what, what, that's what the 80s were. They were like, yeah. 
all over the place and all this new stuff. And then what she did, didn't she do electric boogaloo? Or... She did, yeah. And with mm -hmm. Sam. Yeah, that, that was someone I really wanted to do the costume for, but then they put me on Missing in Action, which... Oh, uh, you would have been great on uh, on Electric Boogaloo. Oh, that would have been uh, fantastic. That was that was such a great name. I can just say Electric Boogaloo all day long. <laughs> yeah, we say it with every sequel. You know, <laughs> yeah, Star Wars Two, Electric Boogaloo. You can say it with anything. Do you know what I mean? It's great. <laughs> anything, anything that ends in two. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> the ultimate rush. Nothing that comes close to it. Not even sex. We are the ex president. Total commitment. It's a real thin line between life and death. I'm not a crook. It's not tragic to die doing what you love. You want the ultimate, you gotta be willing to pay the ultimate price. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and please don't forget to vote. You want to nail the bank robbers and be a big hero? Definitely. The ex-presidents are surfers. You're trying to tell me the FBI is going to pay me to learn to surf. Fear causes hesitation. The hesitation will cause your worst fears to come true. They will take you to the edge. Past it. It's gonna be a great day, Johnny. The taxpayers of Lancet, Utah, they knew that they were paying a federal agent to surf and pick up girls. Babes. Big one. The correct term is babes, sir. Adios, amigo! I just have a general question. What was it like collaborating with actors and directors and bringing the characters to life through costumes? Can you share any memorable experiences you had or? I mean, one that pops in your mind that's maybe your most favorite or something? You know, I find that good actors and good directors allow each other to hire good people and hopefully let them do their job. Costumes, like, the director will probably just not get too involved, have a meeting with me, meeting with the person, and then I'm hired to design something, so I usually try to come up with that character and then I meet with just that actor alone and with a room full of stuff and they often migrate to something that they've already seen in the character that's there and they put something on and then they put it together and then they feel like the person and it's really fun I like it and then you kind of go to the director and the director says well uh, me you know but usually the actors are either so small and just a day player that the director doesn't have time to think about it. and he's like oh that's great or they're really big like because say al pacino and they're gonna wear what they want to wear yeah, the women right. you know so that's fun i i sometimes i've made up characters and they just get so excited about it like oh my god I, you know you have 15 hats and they just go to one and they're just like oh my god this is it and this hat makes is making me my character can i take it home or whatever they like, you know mm -hmm. and work with it and and that's really good and then there's really a lot of insecurity especially in first-time directors and long-time actors that are really insecure now you know mostly female and then you'll get the call in the middle of the night that they don't want to wear what they're supposed to wear and stuff like that which is difficult or i worked with catherine bigelow on her first show and she was so insecure and she would stay up all night and cut pictures out of magazines and bring them the next day and say you know i'm thinking about this and they're, you're you're ready look they're standing there in their costumes uh -huh. you know? they're like hey, this is an action film i need five of those so I mean, I could do something like it right now, but I gotta make sure I can make five more of them. Yeah. And she drove us nuts on that. Sorry, Catherine, we're friends now. Sorry. That was on Point oh. Break, right? Was that on Point, Point Break. Break. Yeah. So you have that where people, where they just, 
I think she was listening to Cameron. I think she was listening to too many people. She, the, the surfboard guy was going nuts. He, he must have made like 50 surfboards before he quit. And he was like, I'm done. A lot of people quit, including me. Because she wasn't happy with the, the surfboard design. So he just kept making more and more surfboards. <laughs> Is that what was going on? Wow. <laughs> Do you, yeah. do you look back at like those movies and because, you know, I, I you hear stories of like, say, Ridley Scott making Blade Runner, sort of the same sort of thing, just insanity of this intention to detail with everything, set design, costume design, they sort of get bogged down in specific areas. But then you, you see the finished product like Blade Runner or Point Break or a lot of these other films that like just stand the test of time and culturally they're just, you know, Point Break is it's a it's a you know it's an iconic film now and the look of it and the aesthetic of it and everything is just so yeah you know uh 80s and wild and its own it's thing so southern california yeah, late it is 80s. Yeah. it is california. yeah it's i mean I, I, do you look back and then go is. that's necessary that sort of insanity is necessary sometimes or do you go that's not that's maybe not maybe like in certain cases maybe not a lot of stuff happens at different time in people's careers I worked with Ridley Scott. He couldn't have been kinder and more generous in himself and giving. And I think he probably went through a lot. Or there's films that he cares more about. You know, some of them are their film, like Titanic was Cameron. And I had a friend that was a costumer and she lost all of her hair because she was so scared. Everyone was so scared. And, but yeah, there's, there's, there's some genius in that. Like, Martin Scorsese or, you know, uh, Tarantino. There's a lot of really, I don't know if genius is the right word, but artistic, amazing people collaborating. And sometimes it just comes out amazing. And sometimes you go, oh, that was supposed to be a really good film. Okay, point break. The reason why a lot of people left, including myself, because she was dangerous, very dangerous. Like she didn't care about what anybody was doing in those costumes. She didn't care that those guys were jumping out of planes with cowboy boots on. And she would actually make them wear them, even though you could just make a practical shoe look like a cowboy boot flying out through the air, you know, stuff like that. She hurt a lot of people, including, it was some relation to her brother-in-law or something who was in sort of some simulated thing they were using that looks like your it feels and looks like you're jumping out of a plane and he got hurt i think he got like paralyzed or something she made the makeup and hair people go up in the plane to do their hair before and makeup before they jumped out and they masks i mean i mean and, and, you know it was it was she wouldn't let anybody wear seat belts and people were getting hurt they went through a couple of stunt coordinators because they were like, no, we're not gonna get in trouble for this. And my friend in that scene, like the plane and the other plane, they, they hit their wings or something. They got too close and they had to parachute out. They parachuted out and landed. She landed in a tree and broke her back. Oh. Wow. And it just got, it just, honestly, it got to where I just didn't want to be a part of it anymore. I didn't want to be the one putting them in those outfits that I found, I was told by many people were going to be really dangerous. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's too much. I mean, we're at the end of the day, you're making a movie and a piece of art, you know, I mean, trying to put people in harm's way, that's excessive and insane and wrong. Yeah, and, and you just have to make those decisions because a lot of people do get hurt. But yeah. usually if they're so safety conscious, you know, everyone's just trying to be really safety conscious. She, she didn't care. But wow. when I was leaving, I remember I went to say goodbye to Gary Busey and uh, Keanu. And Gary Busey was really upset. <laughs> he just came into my trailer and put his trailer and he goes, you can't leave. Don't you know what this is going to do to your career? You're never going to work again. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how crazy he is and oh, i yeah. love yeah oh my god oh my god so i'm like again i'm like oh my god i'm in this room with gary Busey. i have so many moments <laughs> in my, in my life where i was yeah. like and he's telling me i'm ruining my career and i'm thinking about his career <laughs> hmm, he shot probably has a different <laughs> <I should> <laughs> <too>. <laughs> and so 
I was like, it's gonna be okay, Gary. Really, don't don't worry about me. I'll be okay. And he was just like so sincere. Wow. That's Aww. cool. That's cool. It was great. And then, of course, I went right on to another movie or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, a safer but, movie. You know, and Keanu's the opposite. He's like, oh, dude, man. Yeah, it's going to be bad. You know, yeah. he's probably going to be Is Keanu always yeah. laid back as he seems like? Oh, and like... <laughs> 100%. And, and another really funny guy. So many crazy stories. I know I'm not supposed to be like taking up all your time. But no, no, no. Dude, no. Tell us anything. You're not taking up Point any time. Point break. Yeah. Um, the designer on that show had this really, she was just like total hippie Venice Beach girl, you know, used to have all the bands and, you know, Morse and all these people that worked there. And they all hung out there kind of back in the day. So she, she was really cool. And she had this old shack of a three-story house thing that probably is worth a gazillion dollars now. But um, Keanu came over for a fitting rode over on his motorcycle from somewhere we don't know and came in and he was like just tried everything on everything was great you know and then he goes do, do, do you think i could take a nap here somewhere and rosanna's like you know what my son's not home right now he's not staying here right now so Upstairs, you can just go crash on his bed, and he crashed it for like twenty hours. <laughs> 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 and that was it. We just ended the fitting. We put everything up. He was fine. He didn't care, you know. And then we went on to make five of everything, or seven or ten. And then, but when he came down, he was just like, "Hey, dude, thanks. I really like your house." That's so funny. And then he just got on his motorcycle and took off. And like, rode off into the sunset. Like. like <laughs> Ugh, yeah. That's too funny. Let's smoke his Makatoko gold or something. <laughs> <laughs> he's just a really like that guy. I, 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 I love him. I just think he's really great. And he's what smart. Was, uh, he's really smart. What was Swayze like? Uh, was he fun to work great. with? Or... Yeah. Great. Really, really, really nice guy. Very... Yeah, you always hear great things about those two. Like, I, I don't I haven't heard bad things about them. Yet. No, Swayze was another guy that. I think he, he, I think what shows us for a good actor is, is they know when to speak up and when to let other people do their jobs. And I think that's a hard thing to learn for people in, when you have all those egos and stuff, you know, mm. that's a. Well, to be that know, confident, well, like he was confident in his performances and confident in himself. I mean, that says something about him. You know, yeah, like person. he's gonna he's gonna be pa bring Patrick Swayze to the table, yeah. and he's gonna know he's gonna be there that day, and he's gonna know his lines, and he's gonna do them the way he decided in his head that character should be, and all that stuff. So it's probably easier for him to just take a costume and put it on than to make a big fuss about it for you know when he's got other things to think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, in a fitting they do they care, but then at some point. They just, yeah. that's why a lot of them had what I had with being a costume person just for that person. Mm -hmm. Because I just take care of their wardrobe and they don't have to think about it. Like, you know, that's a different dimension. But, but yeah, I, I, that's just my own say. And when I hire people to work with me, I, I don't want to hire somebody that, I want to hire somebody better than me. <laughs> you know, because I respect that. Like, I want people hire really good people and then they don't use them. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I want people to be better than me and give me some input or, you know, if they can do, if they got a character that they can do better than. That's how you that. grow as an artist and a designer yeah. and stuff. Yeah. 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 That's what smart people do is surround themselves by people who are smarter than themselves. Yeah. Well, well yes. and I mean, filmmaking is. I mean, it's all about collaboration. So, I mean, if you're not, don't want to collaborate or you're, you know, it's not the industry for it's you. Hard. It's hard. Yeah, there's a lot of egos and there's a lot of stuff going on. And, and back to the beginning, historical Jesus. Yeah, let's go full circle here. <laughs> full circle. <laughs> that woman that was making those costumes was way out, out of her realm. And all of us were, because maybe we were all making it up back in that time. 
but she had done costumes for university plays and stuff like that. And her husband was the cost, uh, the uh, production designer. And I, I don't think she liked me right off the bat because she was older and I was 22 and, you know, what are we doing? It's threatened by you. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> um, so we'd have a fitting. I was in the first, first fitting with him, and the actor, I don't even remember who it was, asked me something, and I answered him, and she kicked me. Oh. And she said, You don't ever speak in my fittings. Oof. Wow. Jeez. Okay. Damn. Good to Where'd know. you say that Did at? You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. So it just went on from there. She was just really, she didn't like me and I couldn't and I was so likable that back then I was just trying to help you know and right. do my thing and then finally when I was the double agent and I went out onto the field and I didn't got away from her um we had that actor that played Lurch that really giant man oh I don't know his name I know who you're talking about though. yeah of course so he comes to get in his biblical outfit and his feet are like 16 size 15 16 <laughs> God. So she she makes these, you know, cheap action sandals for him that are just like tied on and whatever. And I go to get his clothes at the end of the day and there's one missing. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> this isn't good. So I went back to the costume shop and I said, oh, I got some bad news, but uh, Lurch lost one of his sandals. And she just went off. I mean, she was like, how can he lose his sandals? Where are they? You stupid whatever. She's calling me names and, and um, wow. she goes, she goes, where is it, Nancy? Up your ass. <laughs> oh and the whole room was quiet, right? So I bend over and I look up my ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I pause for drama. And I look up and I go, nope. It's not there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that set her off. <laughs> oh my god! it would have been That's funny great. if we found it. Oh, I found it. <laughs> oh, what if I pulled it out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he could have been right I was there. so uncomfortable. There it is. <laughs> oh, That's so funny. Uh, That's last time I knew I could only get a 14 up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man.